The way that God prunes you is through trial and tribulation. Trial and tribulation is God's method of pruning you. What is pruning? It is to shape and form. What else? Kill what's dead. Some of you need to kill a lot. Others, more than others. And to promote and stimulate. So how does God shape and form you, kill what's dead, and stimulate growth in your life? Through? And? One more time for you two. For, with? And? It's the two T words that most of us don't want to hear. Yeah. Through trial and t- tribulation. So today we're going to be looking at, like I said, the life of Joseph. And here's a summary of Joseph's life. Joseph is a 17-year-old kid favored by his father. He has 11 other brothers that are older than him. They hate him because he's the favorite. He's not only the favorite, but he gets this dream of being this great leader one day where everybody bows out before him. And everybody meaning his 11 brothers, his mom and dad. Now, when the favorite sibling says, one day you're going to bow down before me, that promotes growth in anger. (laughs) So his 11 siblings get angry. They sell him into slavery. He goes from a place where he's with his family, where he understands language and everything. And he gets exiled to a place called Egypt. And in Egypt, he plays a slave. While he's in Egypt, he has God's favor still. Because whatever God calls, no man can take favor off. You can be in the most crummiest situation, but you will have favor in that crummy situation and you will succeed in everything that you do. And I see a lot of favored people here. Man. This guy called Potiphar, who is a really high up there person in Egypt, this, this guy called Potiphar ends up um, hiring Joseph, and he becomes uh, Joseph's, uh, he becomes uh, Potiphar's slave. But he's so good at doing his work that Potiphar ends up entrusting his entire household to him. He's like, you're so good at what you do that I'm just going to give you everything. You have, you have authority over my entire house. That's amazing. So in Joseph's life at this timeline, he's moving up. And he's like, oh, I can see how the promise can come to pass. Potiphar is a pretty high official in Egypt. One day I got this promise. I get it. I see what you're doing, God. Divine connection. (laughs) But then there's a problem that happens. And the problem was that Mrs. Potiphar ends up taking a liking to uh, Mr. Joseph. And day after day, she tells him, sleep with me, sleep with me, sleep with me, sleep with me. And one day she's saying, sleep with me. He says, I can't because I would sin against your husband, which is my master, and I would sin against God. So she's like, I ain't taking no as an answer. So she grabs his shirt and she's like, come here. But he ends up moving, running, and his shirt gets caught in her hands. When he runs and she's left with the shirt, Mrs. Potiphar starts yelling, rape, rape. And she starts insinuating something that was not true and accuses Joseph of something that's not true. Mr. Potiphar, just at that moment, arrives home from work. And this is where we're going to pick up the story, Genesis chapter 39. Potiphar was furious when he heard his wife's story about how Joseph had treated his wife. So he took Joseph and threw him into the prison where the king's prisoners were held. And there, there he remained. But the Lord, I love this, I love it. I can read it with this accent. But the Lord was with Joseph. <laughs> in the prison and showed him his faithful love. And the Lord made Joseph a favorite with the prison warden. So this guy keeps getting like, you know, the favorite everywhere with his dad, with Potiphar, now at the prison, everywhere. Because that's what favor does. Favor ain't fair. And the Lord made Joseph a favorite with the prison warden. Before long, the warden put Joseph in charge of all the other prisoners and over everything that happened in the prison. The warden had no worries because Joseph took care of everything. Now, let me ask you something. When you go to work, do you have the type of character where it's so bad that whatever area you are in charge of, your boss has to worry about everything? Okay, um, with your wife, when, when she has to go or with your husband, or your spouse, or your parents, or your siblings, when, when, when you are the one left in the home, do they have to worry about everything? Or do you have the type of character that makes people go like, 
oh, I know that if Troy is left in charge of the church, I won't have to worry about anything. I know that if we send so-and-so to the other campus, we won't have to worry about it. I know that if Hanny is in charge of the worship team, I know that I won't have to worry about anything. I know that if Hans leads worship at the 6 p.m., I know that I don't have to worry about anything. Um, we have a new drummer called Jules. He's right here. When they tell me that Jules is going to play drums, I I'm at home going like, and I know that I don't have to worry about anything. So, is your character the type of character that when you're left in charge of anything or you're just in proximity to anything, do we worry not or do we worry much? Who are you? Because Joseph had a mindset that he was going to be responsible even in a pruning. Even in a prison. And you know the prison is just a restriction. And sometimes the pruning restricts you. Maybe you don't have the same financial ability in the pruning. Maybe you don't have the mental capacity in the pruning that you did before. Maybe you don't have the emotional tenacity as you did before. Maybe you don't have that drive and that passion because you feel exhausted and you feel heavy. But the question is this. Like Joseph, will we choose to remain faithful while we're restricted? This little passage to me has so many sermon points, which I cannot preach because I have too many points. But it's just such a powerful example for us to look at and see that even when we are restricted, we can still be faithful. And I know that there are moments where you have to take care of yourself. But there has to come a time where we go like, okay, I know that I'm restricted. I know that I got to face this fear. I'm telling you, when you're in the pruning, there are many fears. There are many fears in the pruning because you are in the unknown with something you can't control. So the question is this, will you face the fear? Will you still be faithful while you're restricted? And here is the beautiful thing. And we're going to finish this little passage, just one more, one, more, one more phrase, one more sentence. That when we are faithful during the restriction, during the moments where we can't help ourselves, during the moments where we can't fix our situation, during the moments where we can't change everything, yeah? And the Lord was with Joseph. And watch this, and caused everything he did to succeed. So maybe sometimes in life, I'm not going to feel good, but I'm still going to be successful. Maybe sometimes in life, I will be restricted, but if I remain faithful, God will cause everything to work for my good, your good, our good. For those that trust him and are called according to his purpose. And I believe that we have a bunch of people in this room that are called according to God's purpose. Because like we learned last week, you are not here by chance. You are chosen. I'm so glad you remembered that point. <laughs> that was so beautiful. Joseph's life story is a perfect example of God pruning before the promise. And Paul talks about the process, but not just the process, the formula. And I want to say thank you, Pastor Robert Morris, for all this content. I'm about to rip your sermon off. <laughs> no honor to you in Jesus' name. Paul gives us, Paul gives us the exact image, but through a formula. And this is exactly what Joseph lived in his printing. And this is exactly what some of you in this season right now are going through. Here's what the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans chapter 5, verse 3. He says, and not only that, but we also... Come on, say it like you're really rejoicing. But we also... Glory. And the word glory here in the original is rejoice. To be glad, okay? We also glory in... There's our T word. So we also rejoice in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. And perseverance, character. And character... So this is the exact formula that God uses to prune us before he promotes us. But the question that we repeatedly ask ourselves in the middle of a tribulation is, how can I rejoice and why should I? 
It's one thing to say, I rejoice in my tribulation when life is awesome. It's another thing to tell others to rejoice while your life is going well. But it's a totally different picture when you are saying, I will rejoice in my tribulation when you're going through it. And it's a totally different degree when you're telling others to rejoice in their tribulations when you are not out of yours yet. Because going through it means that there are days where you feel pain. And theoretically, theologically, we know that it's a good thing to rejoice in a tribulation because we know it produces. But for real, for real, when you're going through the episode, when you're going through that moment, where you're, when you're going through the pain, when you're going through the suffering, is it really easy to say I rejoice? I would say that sometimes it's one of the hardest things to choose to rejoice when you're going through pain. So that's why we may know that we need to rejoice while we go through pain. We may know it, but we don't feel it. And so when we're in a process of pain, the question repeats itself. Why would I rejoice myself through this? Well, I got three answers for you on why. Number one, because tribulation produces perseverance. Now you may be like, well, you're just quoting the verse. Uh Uh-huh, exactly. But we're going to unpack the verse because when you read it, you read it super quickly and you let it skim and it just goes over your head and you don't really extract what God is trying to speak to you. So today we're going to extract a little bit what God is trying to speak to us. So Paul tells us that tribulation produces One more time. Tribulation produces? Perseverance. But Jesus' half little brother, called James, tells us something similar. And uh, it helps us understand the scope a little bit. He says this in James chapter 1, verses 2. My brethren, count it all when you fall into various trials. Woo! Knowing that the testing of your faith produces? Patience. Okay, so, okay, let's catch this again, okay? Perseverance, I mean, tribulation produces? Perseverance. Trials produce? Good. One more time. I like that this side of the room, all my UBC students, praise God. <laughs> Try it again, okay? Everybody in the room? Tribulation produces? Perseverance. Trials produce? Patience. What is patience? I'll tell you what patience is. Patience is not necessarily just a verb. Because you can turn patience into a verb, and the verb would be waiting. I think patience is more of a description. If I can take it a little deeper. Patience is more of an attitude. A lot of us can go through a trial and wait for God to rescue us through it. But the big question is, how are you waiting? Are your prayers just you griping and complaining? Because I know that while we're waiting, we're trying to get God to help us. And I listen to me. Listen, listen to me. I get you. And I have my moments too. But one thing I learned today is this. That when you're going through a trial or tribulation, and instead of asking God, get me out, get me out, get me out, and you start thanking him for all the good that he has done, it brings a peace. And it refreshes your strength. Yeah, right. yeah. And it allows you to operate differently, yeah. even though the trial's not over. Yeah. See, how are your prayers? How are you waiting? Yeah. Patience is not what you do, but how you wait. Mm-hmm. Now, perseverance, on the other hand, is fighting while you wait. Mm-hmm. Because perseverance speaks to waging war. Yeah. Patience is the attitude you take while you wait. Perseverance speaks to you waging a war. So a trial produces patience and a tribulation produces perseverance. Now what's the difference between a trial and a tribulation? I'll tell you what it is. The timing. Here it is. Listen to this. A trial is short-lived while a tribulation is a longer period of time. In other words, a tribulation is a difficult battle fought in a longer period of time. So some of you are not going through a trial. I think a lot of you are going through tribulation. (laughs) Because it's been a while, right? See, Joseph did not go through a trial. 12 years in a prison is not a trial, everybody. That's what you call the bigger T word. That's a tribulation. 
And tribulation requires perseverance. Because perseverance speaks to fighting a war. A war is not won in one battle. A war is won through many battles. And there are some of you here, you're so confused because you feel like God left you. You feel like God is not the miracle worker, nor is he the way maker. And even though I don't feel him, he's not working. So you feel confused because you haven't understood the nature of what you're processed under. You're being pruned. And the pruning means that you will go through tribulation. And the tribulation is a long period of time which causes you to have to fight and wage a war. And here's what you have to understand. Tribulation produces perseverance. You can't get physically fit buying an ab machine belt. <laughs> like when I was a chubby little kid in high school, in um, elementary school, I used to stay up late watching TV and they would have these infomercials where you strap a belt on and it goes do, 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 do. And it does the ab workout for you. And then all of a sudden you take that belt off and you're like, oh my God, I got abs. Now, we would be complete fools to think that that was true. But could you believe it that some people did? I was one of them. And some of us want... Like an ab belt, we want a perseverance belt. And we think that perseverance could just be magically prayed for. And God will go, boom, perseverance. There you go, sweetie. <laughs> and if we were to take a poll, how many of you want to be persevering human beings? I think the majority of us would say yes. But how are we planning to get to a perseverance status? Through hopes and dreams and crossing of fingers? You have to understand that in order for you to achieve perseverance in life and be a persevering human being, which is what you admire a lot in others, this is why we quote people that suffered but never gave up. Because you admire them. And if you admire them, that means that's something that you would like to have one day. Now, we want it the cheap way, like an ab belt. But the truth is that God doesn't work through ab belts. God works through process. And here's the thing. If you're going to be perseverant, you have to understand the nature of how God works. And the way that God works is that he's going to prune you. And pruning means tribulation. That's what Jesus said. In this world, you will have trials and tribulation. See, it's been all over in front of us this whole time. We just never picked it up. All right, number two. Why should I rejoice? Because perseverance produces character. Tribulation produces and perseverance produces character. Perseverance is the only thing that will produce character in us, according to the Bible. There is no other way that you will grow in perseverance other than, there's no other way that you will grow in character, sorry, other than perseverance. There's nothing in the scriptures that teaches that your character will grow through other than perseverance. It took Joseph 12 years. 12 years. To have the right character to sustain his destiny. We go through a trial, a trial for six days. And we're like, God, I can't. And you have an amazing preacher here <coughs> who encourages you every week on Sunday. You got YouTube, you can listen to Pastor Stephen Furtick. He's the encourager of encouragers. You got a Bible that you never pick up. You got a city group that is a support system to you. You got a church to be at on Sundays for positive, good vibes. Joseph had nothing but a prison. And that's how, and that's what God knew. That's what God knew. That's what God knew what it would take for Joseph to have the right character in order to sustain the destiny. I think that we would all love to have someone with good character come over to our side, lay their hands on us, and transfer good character. But unfortunately, that would not be process or God. That would be called the occult magic. There is no other way. Listen to me. There's no other way. You can't have developed character unless you go through trials. 
and tribulation. You got to persevere through it. Now, if you're a person of authority, like a parent, a boss, a leader, the worst thing that you can do for anybody, listen to me, the worst thing that you can do for anybody, and I want you to listen to me because this is the worst thing I could ever do for you, is promote someone too early. Because some of you have a lot of gifting. You're very talented. But your character isn't developed. And the worst thing that we can ever do as leaders or as parents or as bosses is to promote someone who is not developed in your character and promote them too early. And here's the second worst thing that we can ever do for a, a, a person in power is to rescue someone from a trial God is using to shape them. I think that Joseph added more time to his pruning season. I'll tell you why. So Joseph, the Bible says, is in a prison and there are two other prisoners in the prison. How many prisoners? Someone said seven. <laughs> They're like, that's a holy number, so I'll just got seven. <laughs> no, no, how many prisoners? Yeah. Okay, now these two prisoners had dreams. And they were troubled. Because they did not know what the dreams meant. And so Joseph goes, what's up? Why you guys look so sad today? They're like, we have two dreams and we don't know what it means. And he's like, well, tell me. I have a God that can interpret it for you. They tell him the dreams. And then Joseph interprets the dreams. One of them was a cupbearer. He was a chief cupbearer who had been put in prison. Who knows what he did? Probably drank too much. <laughs> too many times. <laughs> Got put in jail. <laughs> and so he interprets the dream to the cupbearer. And then the cupbearer is about to go out of prison. And as he's leaving the prison, Joseph tells him, Genesis 40, and please remember me and do me a favor when things go well for you. Mention me to Pharaoh, so that he might let me out of this place. And the story goes that the guy was so happy, he was so happy that the first thing he did was ask Pharaoh, can I have a conversation with you? Um, Joseph is this amazing dude in the prison that interpreted the dream for me. And the dream was true because here I am standing, he told me how to get out and I'm out. And then Pharaoh was like, praise God. Amazing, right? No, guys, that's not what happened. <laughs> you guys believed me. Here's what really happened. Genesis chapter 40, verse 23. Pharaoh's chief cupbearer, however, watch this, forgot all about Joseph never giving him another thought. See, you really know who your friends really are. When they're doing good and you're doing bad and they're there to support you and help you. Yes? yes? But this dude was a bad friend. Joseph served him in his prison while he was just all completely crushed. Joseph encouraged him. And I was happy to receive the encouragement because here's what Joseph was doing. He was preaching good word. Which was encouraging to this chief cupbearer. But when everything went well for the chief cupbearer, he never gave Joseph another thought. Wow. How many chief cupbearer friends do you have? <laughs> Don't answer that question. <laughs> that feels a little fresh for some of you. <laughs> So the story goes on to say that two years later, how many years? Two. Pharaoh gets a dream. And they call Joseph because Pharaoh's disturbed by these two dreams. They call Joseph. Pharaoh tells Joseph the dreams. Joseph interprets the dreams. Joseph provides solutions for the interpretations. And Pharaoh goes, wow, there's no one wiser in this entire land other than this man. I'm going to promote him. So he gets promoted. He goes from prison to palace. From process to promise. From pruning to promise. And he's in charge of many things. Now, who gave Pharaoh the dream? Three-letter word. Say it with me on one, two, three. One, two, three. The question is, 
Why did God give Pharaoh the dream two years later and not two days later? Is it that really interesting to think about? Yeah. Think about it. Yeah. God could have given Pharaoh that dream two days after yeah. the chief cupbearer was released. Yeah. But instead of two days, he gave it to him two years later. Yeah. I personally believe, I personally believe that God, during Joseph's pruning season, must have been watching Joseph. Yeah. And I think that God must have felt very pleased and very happy and very proud of Joseph. Because in his restriction, he was faithful. During his pruning, he was serving. And I think that he must have looked at Joseph in the prison, serving others, going like, my gosh, angels, come over here. Michael, the archangel. Gabriel, come here. Look at Joseph. He's serving even though he's in pruning. He's faithful even though he's restricted. And then the moment Joseph opens his big mouth, <laughs> And tells the cupbearer, drop a hint for me. I think God must have been like, ooh. Wow. So close. He dropped a hint to something only I could do. To something that he should wait on me to do. See, here's the thing. When you are in a pruning season, when you are supposed to persevere so that your character could get developed, you are going to have moments where you're going to want to escape the pruning. And in your attempt to escape, you're going to try to drop hands. And I believe that if God would have taken Joseph out of the prison in that moment, Joseph would have believed that throwing hands is how you get ahead in life. And here's the truth. God can't bless manipulation. And you just got to remember that God is trying to work on a character, so you got to persevere. And some of the battles that we go through during our perseverance is thinking that this is going to be it forever for me. But the truth is this, that Everything gonna be okay. It won't always be this way. Now my words will hurt him, I'm afraid. Now finish it with me. Cause sometimes faith is growing. A little off key, we're like prisoner singers. Off key, behind a few bars. <laughs> This is why perseverance is so powerfully important. Because it develops you. It develops your character. So why should I rejoice during tribulation? Because tribulation produces perseverance. And perseverance produces character. And number three, character produces hope. Now I love this. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 12. Hope delayed makes the heart Yeah. When your hopes don't come fast, mm -hmm. your heart feels the way that you read that with me. <laughs> Should we try it again? Yeah. Hope delayed makes the heart sick. The heart gets sick when you feel hopeless. Joseph served others in his prison. And this shows us that his heart was healthy. Who wants a healthy heart? Yes. Say, I do. I do. I do. Wave at me. Say, I do. I, do. Oh, I, 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 I really do. <laughs> when you serve others, it shows that you have a healthy heart and, and it is aligned with God in spite of your tribulation. So here's the first thing that you think about when you're going through something difficult. Um, when it comes to church world, it's, I'm going to quit serving. When it comes to family, I'm going to quit being present. When it comes to work, well, that one's easy. I quit work. <laughs> no character. No character. No character. And this is the problem. Our commitments 
Our devotion is determined by how we feel. And here's what we do need to understand. Here's what we need to understand. Hope is not God taking us out of a pruning season. Our hope is that he's going to walk with us through it. And, and listen to me. I know that sentence is so cheesy and cliche. God's not going to take you out of it. He's going to take you through it. I get that. That's so cheesy. But listen. In the moment of pain, when you're going through something, someone comes to whisper at your ear. And that's the enemy of your soul. And here's the lie that the enemy is going to want to get you to believe. God left you. And this, this is the new rest of your life. It's over for you. That is the lie that becomes the most tempting thing to believe in seasons and moments of pain. It is the lie that the enemy wants to give you. That God left you. That you didn't get it all. You didn't cross all your T's and dot all your I's. This is not pruning. This is punishment for you. And when we feel like God left us, who is the only one that can rescue us, but the one that can rescue us left us, then we feel alone. And we feel like it's God causing and punishing us. Then we become hopeless. You have the more hope. How are you supposed to get through it when the one that gets you through it left you? That is the biggest temptation in your suffering. That is the biggest temptation in a season of pruning. That is a lie that is tempting to believe because of the nature of your tribulation. But the goal of the lie is to give you a sick heart. And a sick heart always kills hope. But if you allow perseverance to build your character, it is your character that will allow you to stand in hope. Character is what allows you to stand in hope. Listen to me one more time. It's character that allows you to stand in hope. Persevere so that perseverance produces the character that you need because character is what produces the hope. Some of you lack hope right now because your character is lacking. And you lack character because your perseverance is in the gutter. God wants you to persevere. Because God knows that you need character. Yeah. And you know why God knows that you need character? Not just to sustain what he wants to give you because there's pruning before promise. And the promise is coming. Yeah. But God knows that your character yeah. at the end of the day yeah. is what's going to produce the hope that you need to last. Yeah. This is more than just destiny. This is more than just spotlight. Yeah. This is more than just influence. Yeah. This is healthy heart. You need hope. I need hope. But the only way to get it is to persevere. So that my perseverance produces good godly character that is approved by God. And my proved character produces what I need, which is hope. Now here's my conclusion. My conclusion is this. You're about to move up. Yeah. You are about to move up. Only those that believe it will. You're about to move up. A lot of us talk and focus on the pruning that Joseph went through, but we forget to read the promise. So I want to read the promise. Listen to this list. Genesis chapter 41, verse 39. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has revealed the meaning of the dreams to you, clearly no one else is as intelligent or as wise as you are. You will be in charge of my court. That's like me telling someone, you're going to be in charge of my uh, uh, board of directors that's a lot of power they're the ones that take decisions in our church so for me to tell somebody you're going to be in charge of them I'm pretty much saying you're in charge of all the decisions in my church but this is not a church this is a nation that's a lot of power you will be in charge of my court and all my people will take orders from you Joseph a little Hebrew slave not so little anymore eh only I, sitting on my throne, will have a rank higher than yours, Pharaoh said to Joseph. I hereby put you in charge of the entire land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh removed his signet ring from his hand and placed it on Joseph's finger. He dressed him in fine linen, 
fine linen clothing and hung a gold chain around his neck. Then he had Joseph ride in the chariot reserved for his second in command. This guy had a personal chauffeur. Praise God. Praise God. And wherever Joseph went, the command was shouted, kneel down. So Pharaoh put Joseph in charge of all Egypt. And Pharaoh said to him, I am Pharaoh, but no one will lift a hand or a foot in the entire land of Egypt without your approval. Then Pharaoh gave Joseph a new Egyptian name, Lelara Penea. He also gave him a wife. Someone say, praise God. Your husband, wife is coming. Amen. Whose name was Asenath. Asenath. She was the daughter of Potiphar. I hope this is not Mrs. Potiphar. <laughs> that would be a troll from God. <laughs> Mama didn't get him, but the daughter did. <laughs> the priest of On. On. There are too many jokes that can go sideways with that. So Joseph took charge of the entire land of Egypt. He was 30 years old when he began serving in the court of Pharaoh the king of Egypt. And when Joseph left Pharaoh's presence, he inspected the entire land of Egypt. Pruning before process. Let's take a look at the list that this guy just received after his pruning. A, power over the most powerful nation. B, power over Pharaoh's court. C, Pharaoh's own signet ring. This was not that Pharaoh got him a ring made. Pharaoh's like, bro, you can take my ring. That's big. Do you know what a signet ring means? Like nothing can happen unless the king would use a signet ring to pass a bill. That's called authority. And he didn't even make him one. He gave him his own. D, dressed in linen. Fine linen. E, gold chain on his neck. That's some drip. This guy comes out of prison with drip. F, his own chauffeur. How would you like to be driven around after you know being 12 years in prison? Damn. Probably like this guy doesn't have his license, so I'm gonna have to give him a chauffeur. G, respect and reverence. H, a wife, bro. Damn. This guy got hooked up. <laughs> Listen to this. At 17, God gives him a dream. And at 17, he felt like he was on top of the world. <sighs> so God had to bring him all the way down. At 17, he felt like he was at the top. God saw his heart. He was possibly too egocentric. Too full of himself. Too sensitive to comments. Because he was too egocentric. He took himself possibly too seriously. So God's like, if I'm going to put him in a power position, a position of power, and he's this sensitive, criticism will kill him. So I'm going to have to toughen this kid up. I'm going to have to bring him completely down to prison. Now imagine a 17-year-old kid, okay? With all of that power. Imagine him at 17 years of age with egocentricness, with emotional sensitivity. <laughs> and as he's riding in the lands of Egypt in his chariot for second in command, Imagine bowing down to that 17-year-old kid. Can you imagine what would have become of Joseph? I'll tell you what would have become. He possibly would have been a junior Hitler. Because when you have power with no character, you get chaos. And maybe this is why God is pruning you. The promise will come. But the pruning comes first. And a lot of you possibly are in a situation where you are frustrated 
and you don't get the pain and you don't understand why God would and God, when will this finish? When will this finish, God? That was my third option for this title. Some of you are there right now. Maybe confused. Maybe you're not even confused. You are, but you're more angry than confused. And I'm just here to tell you this, that God knew the magnitude of the promise. So he needed the same magnitude in the pruning. And if I could bring it to you, it would say this way. God knows the magnitude of your promise. And this is the reason behind the magnitude of your pruning. 